always liked structure, especially story structure. I love it in movies, TV shows, books, and yes, even video games. One aspect that's always fascinated me is when a story can make you feel something, and it can do it no matter how many times you've seen that specific thing. For a lot of us, it happens with our favorite movies. For instance, the moment Vanellope gets her cart in Wreck-It Ralph. She screams and bounces and just has the dumbest grin on her face and it just makes me smile. For some of you, it could be a number of things, but one thing that has always struck me as something to find enjoyment in is video games, and I often find myself and my friends talking about how we make a video game, be it Pokemon or Mario or Lego or even a Kingdom Hearts game. And that's what I'm going to be doing today, laying down the foundation for a really solid Kingdom Hearts game. Now, when I say that, I don't mean the best Kingdom Hearts game ever, just a good one. One that could be realistically made and maybe take eight years to make at the most. Nomura said that he thought KH3 was announced too early and that kind of rushed the production along. So I'm bumping the work time by three years. That way we have the best case scenario. Not to mention the fact you have to account for the fact there's billion dollar IPs walking around and all the headaches associated with that. Also to save on time and to make things more visually interesting, I'm going to be using the worlds I discussed in my top 11 worlds I want the series video, plus one more. And also, yes, Sora is the main character, so if that bothers you, I'm sorry. I like Sora and I want him around, but there are other characters I want in here as well, don't worry. So you're probably like, now Chris, how would you, with your many years of not having any game design experience, go about making a game? Well thank you for asking, and I'd love to tell you my pitch, for a brand new Kingdom Hearts game. So, what are the tenets to making a well-liked Kingdom Hearts game? From a story standpoint, that is. I'm not looking to change the combat of the number of titles. They all work perfectly for what they're trying to do. However, I will say I want wall fighting. Not wall running with keyblade swinging that takes me off the wall. No, I want this shit. <laughs> Give it to me, Nomura. I need this in my life. Anyway, for a better look at combat, I want to look at the set pieces and bosses. What are the things most people tend to like? Well, from what I've seen, people like three things. Original Disney and main plot lines, since two games are just a repeat to the first one and that got old real quick. Tight, fun gameplay with flashy yet satisfying finishers, summons, and the like. And finally, charm. People really like the series' charm. Yes, the plot is a dumpster fire of plot terms and cliches, but the characters and representations of the Disney plots are what made people stay in the vast majority of cases. These three things are the tent pools that the series nails more often than it misses. Why do you suck, you piece of garbo? These three I won't really mess with, but it's the things around them that need work. Like the combat is fine, and while I have minor gripes with it, I actually prefer the combat in the main three games to any other that I've played, so I'm not fucking with that. The Disney plots are reasonably well done, but there are some things that need to be worked on. The charm factor though on the main characters is out of this world. I even like Donald when he's being an indignant little shit. So while well, that's all good and fine, I think the way the story is structured is just bad sometimes. Like flat out, this makes no sense out of maybe like 1 and 2. I love 3, but the way the gummy ship works from a plot standpoint pisses me off. Gameplay is fine, solid A, please bring this back, it's so fucking good. Story wise though, it sucks. For instance, in 1 you have the ability to fly from world to world and the game gives you bits and pieces at a time to further your travels as you progress through the first half of the game. You get the gummy nav and then once you get the warp drive you can just pop between worlds once they're unlocked. In 2, you get the gummy ship as this little area to fly through and pick the world you want or the gate you have to unlock, but that's still kinda dumb and I'll explain why in a bit. But in 3, the worlds are in different galaxies almost and while I understand having the final boss in its own little mini area makes sense, the other 4 worlds in zone 2 don't make sense, especially the final 2 worlds, but again I'll cover that later on. One thing Kingdom Hearts has done since day one has implied choice as a way to let the player have a bit of a way to make each playthrough unique. However, that's merely a facade that can only really be done on beginner mode in KH1 and maybe standard in all other games, if you enjoy the challenge. Let's take a simple example to make my point for me. The Pokemon Sword, Shield, and Rod of the first game. Picking anything other than the shield was kneecapping yourself because it gave you second chance in Leaf Bracer before you hit level 40, so it was the best option to go with given that game's difficulty curve. This is is reinforced by the fact the Dream Sword gives you second chance at level 46 and Leaf Bracer at 69. So, unless you spend days grinding in Hollow Bastion to obtain that ability for the 
Riku and some fight, there is no reason to pick the other two options, especially when most Heartless and Hollow Bastion can stunt lock you easily even on beginner mode. Going back to gummy ships for a moment, in Kingdom Hearts 1, after clearing the first half of Traverse Town, you have two ways to go. You can either head up or right to Wonderland, or you can head down or left to Olympus. You have to do both before you can progress past this first zone, but you still have a choice. The thing is, the easiest path, and the one that the developers clearly want you to take, is to go up and loop back around, since that's the way the difficulty curve goes. Kingdom Hearts 2 does something similar with its gateways, but its limiting system is just… well… dumb. For example, when going from Hollow Bastion initially, you can go to Land of Dragons or Beast Castle, and nowhere else. The game has other levels, they're just blocked off by… space energy, I guess? What the fuck even is this? And they only go away once you beat both prior worlds and unlock the gates, at which point Olympus is just suddenly there, ditto with every other world. I'm aware this is to prevent players from going to, say, Agrabah too soon, which would then cause them to get their asses kicked instantly, but you also have level 1 crit mode as an option, so difficulty is not the biggest issue. I want to do away with this entirely. The one thing 3 had over 1 and 2 was the fact that gummy sections are optional, aside from literally flying to the world from whatever point you enter space from. So let's keep that, making the overworld vast and easy to navigate, and plenty of those warp pipes. Most people like that, but if you like the on rail section, those can be extra high challenges that don't affect anything in the main game aside from the trophies, or maybe journal completion, whatever you want to go with, and you can use whatever ship you've made in those or have preset ones like in 2. One thing to add though is make the gummy ship faster, like just 75-50% to 50 faster. Just god, the overworld is really hard to traverse sometimes. So here's my biggest departure for gummy ships and the series on the whole. I want the worlds in the game to be in one zone, one part of space, except for the final world, like the world that never was, or even Scala ad Kylum again, but this time you get to explore more of it, or Daybreak Town, or here's a crazy idea, make a new place that actually we get to spend time in this time. Also bring back Traverse Town, I missed that place. So here is the pitch. The starting world is now Disney Castle, with Yenstedt's tower either now perfectly next to the castle rather than Twilight Town since that never made sense anyway, or it moves consistently in the overworld. I got this idea from KH3's loading screens talking about how the tower moves, and I liked it, so let's run with it. Whenever you exit a world, the tower will be in a new preset location on the map, and it changes every time you enter the overworld from a level. So say you beat Toy Box and get an alert to go to the tower, and it's midway across the map. You go to the gummy ship, and it's still where it was when you selected it. However, when you enter a world, the tower will change location randomly between the 11 preset ones. The other 14 worlds, yes I said 14, are going to be in set locations, but to make up for this, the overworld is going to be massive. I liked 3's approach to this, but the biggest problem is that when you enter Zone 2, there's just clouds over the Caribbean and San Francisco for no reason. 2 did this as well, where the map simply wouldn't let you go to the world for some reason, I have no idea why. In 1, it made some sense why you couldn't see a world or go to it yet. The gummy ship wasn't powerful enough, and it was blocked by needing the gummy nav. However, in 2, it just doesn't show you the world. It could be darkness in both 2 and 3, but it's still just weird. Also, yes, I do know that 2 and 3 kind of finagle it with saying new paths are opened or closed, but paths are different than just not seeing the fucking thing, and that drives me insane. I mean, in 2, Sora says after locking a keyhole that a new pathway is open, so maybe the worlds are just ready to open their legs and let you fly in for the heartless abortion, or something, I don't know. Either way, it also makes playthroughs extremely similar to one another. For most people, 2 plays out as Twilight Town, Hollow Bastion, Land of Dragons, Beast Castle, Olympus Coliseum, Disney Castle, Time River, Port Royale, Agrabah, Halloween Town, Brightland, Space Paranoids, Radiant Garden, and then the return visits. Sure, you could switch Land of Dragons and Beast Castle and Halloween Town with Agrabah if you wanted, but with how hard KH2 can be, most people don't bother. 3 has a similar problem in that only one world is optional, whereas the Brightlands, Atlantica, and the Hundred Acre Woods are completely skippable. Which, fair enough, but here it's only one, that being the Hundred Acre Woods. All 11 other worlds are mandatory and you must play them in a strict order so as to not get stomped by the difficulty curve. In my game, I want there to be 12 worlds that you can pick from in any order you want, not counting the other four. Those being the final world, which everyone Nomura wants to go with, I don't care, the tower, Twilight slash Traverse Town, and Disney Castle. And if you see my list video, you're probably asking yourself what the 12th one is, but again, we'll get there just 
hang on. I do have to say, the wasteland level is inside Yenzen's tower, but the game will address that the first time you go to the tower. But unlike the past games where the 100 Acre Woods required you to find pages, in this game it's treated like every other level. The difference is in how you get there. So when I was coming up with this concept, I thought it made sense to have Sora and Co. start at Disney Castle. The gang have now formed the Council of Light, which basically just waits around for Heartless to attack. But they also spar and practice on simulations of Heartless from past games. This could also be the tutorial if you like, or it could be skippable if the player doesn't want to deal with it. Another thing I thought of for this is that we could have like a Batcave looking room where Sora and Riku can look at their old outfits and occasionally someone in the group will say something about each outfit and just make the whole thing seem more sentimental. Oh, and give them rooms. I know all 10 of these anime chuckle fogs have homes to go to, but we're never going back to Destiny Island, so let's just have them set up shop here and be done with it. Anyway, once you've skipped or beaten the tutorial, Mickey or Yenzo or Yensid tells you about a new batch of Heartless that have interesting new abilities, have started popping up at the world, and you have to go and stop them. And that's really it. You spend the game fighting blobs of darkness in Disney World. So what's so game changing about this one? Well, for one, I want the Heartless to be different. I like the idea that each game has the Heartless be a new flavor of Strange. Be that a new Heartless design, or a gimmick, or expanding on the idea of what darkness in someone can be. In Kingdom Hearts 1, they were just the manifestations of darkness in one's heart. 2 was the body, Birth by Sleep was all about the emotional aspect, and Dream Drop Distance was about how dark dreams and our subconscious can be, and 3 showed how these can combine in a weird way, since a Heartless soldier can go inside an first mech. So while that seems like everything is all set and good, I think that it can be tinkered with ever so slightly, so maybe this time have the unversed mixed with nobodies, or even dream eaters, to create new kinds of heartless called the unkindness, or maybe just the amalgamates since that could have been part of Bexton's research while he was in the organization. And while I know the amalgamates isn't the most original name out there, it's not like Bexton was ever the best with his naming guys. I mean, Recuplica is a fan name given to Riku Replica, so it's something to work with. Anyway, that could give you a chance to have the natural heartless be a thing just roaming as part of the game, but this way you get new bosses and even just some straight up new concepts in terms of a fight. Like for instance, if the creature is mostly a dream eater, physical hits won't do much, so coating them with magic like fire, water, or even just burying them will do more damage since it's magical and thus can ignore the laws of physics, and the nobody centric ones would be better dealt with a strength focus build since they are real and are governed by more physical types of things. This way magic and strength builds are equally reliable and thus the game can't be cheesed by spamming magic to late game when you're so over leveled it doesn't matter anymore. So in this game you can pick any world you want at any time. Yeah, there's no preset path by the developers. Each world has a level value like normal, but you get to pick the order. Let's say you go to Toy Box to defeat the evil Yozora toy that came to life and is taking your friends or whatever, and that world is say level 5, but the worlds going down the line are say 1 to 8 levels higher than the world you just played. So the next one would either be at level 6, 7, 8, 9, or 10, and so on and so forth. And this will be in effect for the whole game. But there are some tweaks so that you just can't level past stuff and you actually have to try and use your level ups wisely and take advantage of the time in a certain world. For instance, if you reach level 20 and you're in a level 17 world, and the next world is say, level 18, well, now when you get out, each world gets a bump in level by about 2 or 3. So that way, you're consistently coming up against challenging stuff until like level 80. And near endgame, Zigbar has the worlds covered in darkness, so all the worlds after you beat the last mandatory one are 60 or higher, again, capping at 80. One thing Kingdom Hearts has a problem with is level balancing. By having the player be given certain spells and upgrades after script fights, it means that they don't have to worry about their levels unless they want second chance once more in Leaf Bracer or even Combo Master. So by making the game get harder, even its easiest level, it'll make things more of a task for the player to get through, but in a fun way. One aspect I want to touch on that might help with the difficulty curve is the leveling Keyblades mechanic. I think 3 had a great idea, and it invariably makes New Game Plus both harder and easier since you now have all the Keyblades, but they're at their base stats and therefore need to be leveled up. The problem is that you can't buy fluorite till midway through the game, so now you have to pick your 3 or 4 phase and stick with them so you can switch mid game. I think the best way to keep this going forward is to make us work for the form changes. Every Keyblade gets 2 form changes now, one at like level 3 and let's say there are like 12 levels, and you have to get it to halfway or more to have the second one be unlocked, and past that the form changes get longer and the Keyblades get more powerful, the sole exception being the Kingdom Key, which gets 3 form changes, one for each prior game. So third form, second form, and first form for different game combo modifiers. And you can choose which one to skip to after it's fully leveled, which will more than likely happen during your first playthrough. So have fun with that. 
This makes the player have a better feeling of progression. Pokemon does this extremely well with its starters and most other Pokemon. You have the base form, then around level 14 you get a new form, and then in the mid 30s it gets another one. And it makes things feel a lot weightier because of it. Also, I think if you're going to do DLC Keyblades for this thing, it makes sense to have the Oath Keeper and Oblivion again. Although I'd make those story events with Riku and Kairi, but eh, that's just me. But here's an idea. The X-Blade for like three bucks, and that turns you into like Rage Form with the combos of Final Form since you can rip the blade apart, and it's two Kingdom Keys with giant blades on the end of it. That fucking play, man. Seriously. Also, here's a random thought. Remember the heart binders from 3? Well, why not make those interchangeable? I threw out suggestions for summons in my list, so why not give the players, say, 4 to 5 slots, and then let them mix and match whichever ones they want at any given time to create their own summon system. This allows us to, say, have a crowd controller, an on-the-rail shooter, a final smash, and a straight-up AoE one, or just have combinations of different ones you like so it's not all so samey. I love the summons of later games, but variety helps a lot. Worldwise, I think it makes sense to have the game go the way of Kingdom Hearts 3. Landscape and plot-wise, the worlds are perfect. 3's main goal was to create living, breathing worlds that felt alive, or that had to explain why there aren't people here so that we can stop modeling NPCs tomorrow, please we wanna go home! Which it did well, so let's keep that philosophy for this game and work out from there. Let's take the Alola region for example. In the world I presented, we could have both Mele Mele and Akala Island with dozens of new Heartless types that have made the local people people and Pokemon leave the islands to go to either the Aether Foundation or Pony Island for safety. This gives the developers a reason to have you not encounter wild Pokemon, only trainer and PC Pokemon. Game Freak have already done this by having every one of the two motherfuckers they care to model have the same Pokemon anyway, so seeing the same handful of NPCs with the same handful of Pokemon wouldn't break the immersion more so than any other playthrough of a Pokemon game. Let's say there are four different NPCs. That means you only need to do about four Pokemon for the characters we don't need to interact with that much, but things look more lived in. There is a problem in the form of the classmates, Professor Kakui, Hal, Lusamine, Wiki, Faba, Guzma, Plumeria, Gladion, and the Grunts. Now, the Grunts you can hand wave away by having them just be already beaten off screen, or by having them tell you their Pokemon are ineffective to the threat of the Heartless, but Either way, you could just bullshit your way out of not designing them a Pokemon, and no one would bat an eye at it. Still though, even just considering these characters without their signature Pokemon is a lot to consider. Plus, Nurse Joy, Officer Jenny, and their partner Pokemon. Following that, you want to have both Tapu Koko and Philae in this. I'm not saying it can't happen, it's just hard to implement for a world rather than a whole game. It's possible, just unlikely, so having them deal with just Ash and his mons and the legendaries would be more cost effective, and I think either an entirely new heartless Pokemon monster as the final boss, or just making the Tapus evil would be really cool. Like having the made up Pokemon boss be able to control all the elements and make use of the whole rock paper scissors aspect the series is known for would make a really enjoyable boss fight, especially if Rotom Dex is there freaking out whenever it saw it. And then there's Beware, Meowth, Marini, Jesse, James, and Mimikyu. I think it would make sense, especially Especially if when this game is in development, Game Freak will just already have made the models for the Switch versions of these Pokemon, so Square could get those models and save on time. And the models for all the human characters besides Ash, obviously tweak them to work in the new environment. Still, it could work. Again, it's unlikely and cumbersome, but I think it'd be worth it. Plot-wise, I just see us heading from the beach of Mele Mele to the top of Wella Volcano on Akala Island as our goalposts. We just go around the islands and encounter Heartless and save random NPCs and learn about the heart of Lola and the power of Pokemon and all that jazz. Stuff like that would make this all seem a lot more fleshed out and make new people to the Pokemon TV series care about Ash and the characters in it. It's a lot of work, but I think with having updated Pokemon models and the 3DS models for the humans as references, it cuts the middleman down by like 75%. I also want the player to feel like time has passed in these worlds. KH2 did this really well with the return visits, and I want to bring that back. 3 had this to some extent in that, besides a handful of worlds, every world has stuff happening after you left to have it feel like things are moving on. In Olympus, you see them fixing the town. In Twilight Town, you see them having the film festival and the restaurant gets busier. Just stuff like that. So now every story has a first arc. For the Pokemon world, that would be the entirety of Melee Melee and defeating one of the Foreteller students, and that causes the Heartless to die down, and the gang leaves to one of the other 11 Disney worlds that are available to them. Also, once you beat the first arc, you get that world's Keyblade, since I hate not getting new gear till halfway through the game. It's super annoying. Anyway, let's say they do Wonderland. They get there, see Alice, meet the Hatter and Co, and we leave them once Alice is with the White Queen, so that later, when the Fravdus Day comes, we have time to let it sink in and feel like time has passed. However, you then have the option to pick a new world or go back to Alola to finish the story there. This way, the game has a sense of choice. You can pick any level at any point and 
continue the story, so long as you have beaten another arc in another story. So you can't just pull up Pride Lands and wait to go there back to back like I do. You must go from one to the other so that the story has time to breathe. KH3 has an issue with the story of really only one world, Toy Box. Seeing as Toy Box has a natural lull in the story, and rather than the gang going back home, then Rex sneaking off after getting frustrated at his name, or something, to then have Buzz get kidnapped. We just have this weird point where we had to go back up after just coming down for no real reason. But now, with the two act structure, we have a reason to let the lull for the characters be a lull for the player as well. Some ideas I have for the plot in each world to be unique would be to have the four tellers have about three apprentices apiece that we meet in each world and encounter. Something I really liked about 1 and 2 were the amounts of humanoid bosses as opposed to Genie Jafar. All the fights felt more real since the AI for those fights are more complex than, oh, you're hitting me? Here's some lightning that does no damage. Demix is a great example of this. He shows off the reaction command system well, he has a mechanic that makes you pay attention to what's going on, he has a well-rounded attack pool that you can still exploit if you know what you're doing, and is just a really good mid-game boss. So, so, by having each of the apprentices be fought somewhere in each world, say the middle or end of Act 1, you have a great opportunity to make each fight a gimmick that relates to the foreteller they follow. For instance, say in the Kim level, the Little Mermaid level, and the Incredibles level, you encounter one of a said students. Since he's a big brute, it would stand to reason all of his students are as well. One focuses on heavy attacks, but has a cooldown window that lets you wreck him for a bit, but he will break out of it if you get too greedy. Another is big on elemental magic, so Cure, Mad, and Reflect are gone, and he has a lot of ether, so he doesn't just wander around for half the fight, waiting for his MP to recharge. But, when he uses one, you have the time it takes you to use one to get in there and wreck him like before. There are obviously other points to do chip damage as well, but that's just good boss design for you. And, once he reaches his revenge value, he uses the barrier water creates to push you back and go right back into casting. I do have to add here that he has a massive MP bar for this to work, and the ether is fully restore him from zero, kinda like an elixir, but not with the healing, along with having damage siphon for his MP. So he's just broken enough for the fight to work, but he's not lingering will broken. And lastly, this one's just got a lot of abilities. Kinda like Dark Inferno, but more so his close-up slashes and not the AoE balls. This one would attack like Sora, just normal Keyblade swinging, but he just does more damage, showing that style can do heavy damage. Things like that could work for all the foretellers. Ira is balanced, so his students all focus on similar things as before, but do less damage since they mix up attacks a lot more often. Envy is a snake, so her students would be more like if Final Xemnas and Zigbar had a baby, constantly teleporting and shooting projectiles from portals. And because because Gula is more passive than the others, his students would focus on different reaction commands and maybe even would need a certain magic or summons to make the fight easier. Things like that can make a boss fight go from good to great, and what's more is that this can all be applied to the foretellers themselves. One thing the organization lacked in KH3 was their real sense of individuality from each other, before Remind that is. Before Remind came out, they all just kinda swung at you with different particle effects. Here, since we've built up the fights with having three mini bosses per foreteller in the game, the foretellers could pull from the three apprentices during the fights. So, for a said, he'd use a lot of hard-hitting attacks and a decent amount of magic, but would also use a small amount of abilities as well. This way the climax feels earned. Also, when each student is in battle with Sora, their master is watching them to see how the fight goes, and to also stop Sora from completely finishing them off. So that way we have a bit of a dialogue formed between the foretellers and Sora. That's just one idea I have for the big baddies of the game. There are so many more, but we need to move on. Alright, with the base setup out of the way, I wanted to talk about the 12th world that I'd kind of been tiptoeing around, and I know all of you are going to groan when I say this, but it's the Hundred Acre Woods. I really like the world, and rather than it being a book, I want it to be a physical world that we get to explore. I mean, it's the Hundred Acre Woods, and we only ever spend time at the characters' houses, and really, I think the series deserves better. So, here's the story pitch for this world. In this game, Tigger, now stay with me here, Tigger is taken over by the darkness since no one but Rue will bounce with him and he's always told by Kanga to come home to have dinner or go to bed or have a bath or what have you, and he just gets sad. The darkness takes him over and he starts being heartless in the Hundred Acre Woods. Ball heartless, Pogo heartless, Hopping Carrots, the letters P, Z, and B are all heartless since this is a kid's imagination and all those things are related to bouncing in some way, and I guess Rabbit since he likes to fuck with him a lot, I don't know. Now, mind you, the heartless aren't hurting any one in the woods besides you since they're more just scary and annoying. They're like the Baxin or Heffalumps before Lumpy was introduced. The best part of this whole idea to me is that now Tigger has his Halloween costume on and is just Mam Tigre and is still just his silly bouncy self but is also just 
evil. One thought my friend had was that Rue would also be his sidekick because up until the Heartless showed up, everyone thought this was just playtime. And to make sure Rue was safe, since Tigger wouldn't hurt him, they just never tell him that the Heartless were Tigger's fault. And in every cutscene after Van Tigre is created, you just see Rue behind Tigger bouncing in and out of frame going ha and Roar! while pulling his cape over his mouth and nose like a vampire. And in the boss fight, he's just bouncing around the barrier of the arena and is just doing that and encouraging Tigger. Oh, he's so cute. And just to fit the theme of the world better, Donald and Goofy are turned to plushies. And if you lose the fight, rather than dying, you just get knocked down and Tigger does his laugh and bounces away to the restart position for you to fight him again since this is all a big game inside a storybook after all. I'm laying all this out because I'm the only one I know that likes KH1 and 2's version of the world. KH3 is not so much because the minigames were just kind of repeated and it wasn't all that fun, but now here it's both optional and plot relevant at the same time. One thing I forgot to mention earlier is that while there are seven worlds before the final one, but now I'm adding Disney Castle, Twilight Town, and Radiant Garden into that, and if you count the tower and the wasteland as one location, that's 17. Anyway, you only have to do 10 of the Disney worlds and 5 story mandated ones, but you can choose any of the 10 you want and you will miss nothing of the story. Yeah, you'll miss a couple of boss fights, a few dozen chests, two whole storylines, and their keyblades, but that's all well and good now, since if a world isn't to your liking, you can just stop and leave rather than having to power through it since the game isn't forcing you to be here. For instance, after you beat the first world's first arc, Mickey calls you telling you about the foretellers and Sora says, yeah, we just met one. Then we go on about some lore or what have you, and then Mickey ends up telling you to keep up the good work and to check back into the worlds often. Things like that to help things move along would be really nice. However, once you beat the second world's first act, he reminds you to visit the past one at some point to check in, but also to not ignore new worlds. What this does is tell the player that they can go back and forward at the same time, but they can't just stay in one place. Each arc finish leads to a cutscene, either at Disney Castle or in the ship, telling you a piece of information that moves the plot along and is relevant. So no matter what order you play the worlds in, cutscene 1A will always be followed by 2A. It does not matter in which order you finish the arcs because the cutscenes will always play in the same order to keep the overarching plot as simple as possible. Like I said at the beginning, the structure around the worlds is what's important, so that the player has choice but can also follow the story. Now once you complete the second arc and check in with everyone, that one can be a bit of a throwaway, like checking in with the Birth by Sleep trio, or even Riku, Axel, and Kairi doing their own things elsewhere. That way the story is happening with Sora and not because of him. So, this is going to seem like a weird ask of Square, but damn it, it's the one standout moment of post-world content that isn't copy-pasted from 2. Give us more side quests that aren't just mini-games. Yes, the Flan are cute, but what I mean is the kid from Olympus. He wants 5 gold Herc statues from around Thebes, and if you give them to him, he gives you a pretty decent accessory right out the gate, and it's so cool! Thebes seems to be the only world to have this. Even Pirates, which had an entire town full of NPCs, is missing this feature. I want more of this. Some can be tied to story, but most need to be fun little side things. Remy's cooking game is nice, and I think that having that again would be really cool. But going out and collecting stuff for characters would be awesome since we get to experience different things and get rarer items. See also the Moogle picture requests. Say for instance you're in Wonderland, and Morana the White Queen has you go and get her ingredients for some potions that a gang of Heartless stole. This would be a world specific specific side quest because the ingredients are only found in Wonderland. For one that bridges gaps between worlds, let's say Phineas asks you to find some tools the Heartless took to other worlds, and when you bring them back, they give you like an Orcachalum Plus, or something rare like that. For the Moogles, you can bring them Final Fantasy Easter eggs that make them like you so much, they start selling higher level stuff like Damascus and Anamantite like they do for Fluorite since this shit is a bitch to find. You could even bring back the photo side quests for Namine since she loves to draw and is just stuck in the castle. It gives her a way to feel like she's going on a journey with you. And every time you come back to see her after the game accepts the picture you took, her room has sketches of your friends and all the little cows you've shown her, and once that's all done, she gives you her own keyblade called like Sketchpad or Rainbow Pen or something. Or she gives you an item related to drawing in some way or another. Just make side quests that make us care about the characters we interact with. The final level would just be a bog standard final boss area seeing as those are always done well. The foreteller is followed by Lushu and then the secret boss would be some cool new character or just a giant monster like in past games. Basically, don't mess with a formula that works. Also, I've been saying this for years now, but you remember that heartless training ground thing in the castle I mentioned before? Well, why not use that as a boss rush simulator? Or just let us reselect a boss fight from the database. So far, the only bosses in the series that you can replay are the Data Orc fights, the Challenge Gate slash Mirage Arena and DDD and BBS respectively, Dark Inferno, Lingering Will, Yozora, and the KH2 Ursula Song fight. That's not cool, man. Just make the bosses with a bigger health pool and maybe a few new moves as a hard option. Or if we want to redo the OG fights, let us do that too. 
In this case, it's a simulation, so it really wouldn't matter. You've done it before on the Olympus Cups, so why not just go hog wild with the idea? Also, stop making heartless monsters out of Disney characters. You chose these characters to be in a fight, so make them fight. If you want to give them new abilities due to the darkness in their hearts, so be it. It's fine, but just stop doing the suddenly they turn into a giant monster shit. It's annoying. Some other ideas I had, people really like the Final Fantasy aspect of things, so let's make them more prevalent. I want to focus on the more recent Final Fantasies though, seeing as 10 was the new hot thing when KH1 was being released, it makes sense that we see more characters from that time period, mostly from that and 7, but since then we've had 13 and 15 which are a lot of people's favorites. Personally I think 15 has a lot more potential, so let's work with our pretty boys. Ignis either works with Remy now or flat out replaces him, and completing the menu in his journal gives you a keyblade that can turn into those blades he swings around. Prompto loves him some pictures, so while Naminé wants landscapes and scenery, Prompto would more than likely want his missions to be people-based or specific items. His Keyblade would obviously morph into some kind of gun, and we can call it Shutterstock or something camera-related. Gladio, the big beefy sexy sword man, what? And he's how you upgrade your Keyblade directly, rather than just funneling them through the Moogle shop. After beating a super boss, which I'll get to in a second, he'll give you a really physically powerful Keyblade that cuts the requirements for upgrading in half. This will carry over into New Game Plus as well because it'll make the grind less of a pain. You can call for them by way of these chocobo stands by the Moogle shops. The whole concept of 15 was basically a camping trip with your boys, so why not make that part of the game by having it be so the gang are always just camping whatever world you're in? I think that makes sense at least. Lightning and Noctis could be boss fights in respective worlds. Once you beat Noct, Gladia will give you that Keyblade I mentioned earlier. Oh, another idea I had, let's make learning magic an in-universe thing, or bring in more modern kid things like Sophia the First. We can go to Royal Prep where the good fairies are, we do some small lesson with Sophia, and boom, get a magic upgrade. I think that could be fun. Maybe have Sora regress into his KH1 form in that game's outfit, and Donald and Goofy turn into real animals that Sophia can understand due to her amulet. Keyblade skins and or color schemes. Just let us make him look a little different. A simple palette swap you can get from finding stuff or buying it and applying it to the blade would do wonders. And my last random thought is, give Sora color palettes as well, or make it so that we can buy other outfits that go through similar swatch changes and when we use the form changes aren't affected. My final talking point is fair. Make the game fair. KH1 Standard and KH2 Proud Mode are the fairest out of the entire series, since it makes things harder but doesn't kneecap the player. The data fight's are reasonable to take on, and I'd say the only impossible thing for me personally is Lingering Will. I just hate him. Sorry. 3 has the opposite problem, where everything except for the first two worlds on critical mode are easy, and then you just start leveling past everything, and then only the bosses present a challenge. But I think having the middle ground be standard, and beginner be easy, with Proud being the hardest version, with critical mode living up to its name, is the best approach. But, the difficulty curve has to be consistent. 2 did that very well. 3 has a smooth one as well, until critical mode Superman jumped the moon. I think with the Keyblade and summon functions I mentioned earlier, the game has a fair balancing system and the fact the game levels with you until the end, it makes sense since it forces the player to understand the game and take the time to appreciate the levels. Kingdom Hearts is something that everyone should be able to get into, and with the wide range of worlds for this concept and the overall tone, I think that, with the way the series is going, it has the potential to be one of the more engaging and less bash games in the series. Here's hoping someone with power listens to this. My name is Chris, and I hope you all have a fractastic day.